Ted, thank you so much for allowing us to come over to the Everglades uh, and to visit with you and your great story, your beautiful home here right on the island. Uh, it's been a while. I saw you, I think, a year ago at the BTT right. Circle of Honor. Right. But every time I see you, I, I feel uh, it's a special moment because of your human success story is outstanding. Uh, you're 84. You're here on the island. Tell me a little bit about your life now. I mean, we're, we're going to go through the, the spectrum, but you're 84. How are you feeling? I feel pretty good. You know, it's, and I'm not as agile as I used to be because I broke my hip a couple of years ago. So I actually watch where I'm stepping. I'm not going to jump from the dock into the boat and from the boat into the dock and door run. See, I got my house. I live in a stilt house and I have steps going up and down, up and down. So when I go shopping, I get two bags in my hand and run up and run down. So now I'm kind of careful because I don't want to get caught on again. I, yeah. I'm, I'm done. I know? understand. I'm done. And, I, and uh, feel okay. Everything. My eyes, you know, not as, not as good as it used to be. I never went to eye doctor for like, shoot, until I was 80. Because uh, the eye doctor asked me, how come you didn't, co you know, you didn't come and see me? I says, because it never hurts. Right. <laughs> he says, you could see. Yeah, I could see. Not as good as I used to, but I could see. So they checked me out and everything, and they gave me a pair of glasses. And then uh, I have to wear it when I drive because uh, if I get in a car wreck and then I don't have the glasses on, it's going to be my fault. So. Right. But I'm still going around without glasses. I could see pretty good, and, and uh, that's where I'm at. Well, you look pretty healthy. You know, your, your, your brain is sharp. Uh, well, you feel it slipping uh, no, at all? No, well, yes, because when I do something, see, I do a lot of work for the crabbers in this island. When they break something, or, or mostly they come here when they break a bolt into a engine or break a bolt in a manifold, they can't get it out. And I told them a hundred times, I said, don't mess with it, bring it here. But they don't listen, so they drill a hole drill it off center of the bolt, then they put an easy out, then they break the easy out, then they bring the stuff. So <laughs> I said, don't be doing that. So <laughs> Make my job easier. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so when they out fishing, you know, on there, and somebody says, oh, I just broke this, broke that, they know it, they got on a radio. I said, oh, no, don't touch it, don't take it, because he ain't going to take it out. So Right. But, you know, I, I, I do well. I could see well. The, how did you, I mean... We're going to go back. I know you're, uh, the main real business is in Del Rey. How did you yeah. find uh, this island, um, Everglades City? Well, I, uh, I used to have a houseboat in Flamingo for many years, for about 15, 16 years. And I had people from Chukaluski come down there and then fish and moved around and doing this. And my fishing club friend, Bob Andre, had a house over here, so I come down and visit him, and uh, I, I had a really good time in Flamingo, it was very, very good. The Flamingo, one of the best fishing spots that time, you know, about 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And then uh, I, the houseboat was a little bit too much for me to keep it up and run it to Whitewater Bay and fish out of it and so forth. So then I looked for somewhere I could keep the houseboat, so I wind up over here in uh, Chukaluski. And luckily, when I bought here, uh, the real estate market was nobody wanted to buy anything here because of the mosquitoes. And uh, still today, a lot of people buy homes or buy lots or whatever, and they figure they're going to retire here. But then the wives come with them, and then find out nothing to do but fishing and plus the mosquitoes. So this, you know, this thank God, you know, uh, God made this thing a, a heaven for me. Oh, good for you. Yeah. I know that Steve came here when I first started fishing in the Laura Keys uh, close to 30 some years ago. And he said, uh, you know, for him, it was getting a little crowded down there. I said, well, what do you like about that, you know, that island over there? He said, well, there's a lot of, a lot of fish, a lot of mosquitoes and no people. That's correct. And still, still, still the same, you know, it's still mm -hmm. pretty much, the fish is not so much uh, uh, like it used to be. It, we we, we uh, just a lot of times go around and go to places uh, we used to catch them and there's nothing there and you get frustrated after a while. But, you know, I'm to the point in my life now, as long as I'm in the game, I don't have to score. 
coach right. put me in, I'm in the game. <laughs> I don't score, I don't care, I already scored a bunch. So I'm happy as can be. What do you see when you look out at the uh, waterway right here, your front yard? Well, I see the, uh, the other side of this bay, well, actually halfway to the bay, that's, that's Everglades National Park. They never ever gonna build anything. And it's a lot of uh, a lot of wonderful memories going back to them rivers, you know, up the Turner River, go to the bays, and a lot of times uh, you just go across the way in a right tide. Uh, you're gonna catch your redfish, and you could have your supper, and and it's just and and uh, you know the boats start coming around again, you know, uh, on a, on a weekends people come, but fishing not that good, so. Uh, and the weather have a lot to do with it, and the tides. The tides is really, uh, uh, if you don't know, then you're always on the ground, and some places you can't even go. Right, well you talk about the weather, and I wanna talk uh, also too about Herman Lucerne, I think was a oh, good yeah. friend of yours, and yep. he was, yep. uh, when you associate 10,000 Islands, the Everglades, Herman Lucerne was, the captain, if you well, will, the of man that of the, Man of the Glades, I yeah. made him a fly reel, and I, he had me, uh, uh, engraved in the back, Man of the Glades. And he had that real for, actually I had uh, uh, a luck to, uh, you know, stay with him on his houseboat and also his house. And uh, he uh, he died in a, uh, in Hurricane, Hurricane uh, Andrew. He died at his house. He oh. used to be the mayor of Florida City years ago, and uh, he died during a hurricane. I remember Flip speaks of Andrew when yep. he was in his bathtub with his wife yep. and the roof blew off. Where were you during that storm? Well, you believe it or not, I had a houseboat in Flamingo and I was fishing in the Keys. I was fishing in Key West with a friend of mine, a Bruce Cronin, you know, and then I kept watching the television and I, and I showed the Andrew coming across the Atlantic and it didn't go right, didn't go left, it's aimed right to Miami. And I says, doggone it, I better come back and tie my houseboat down. So I came back before the hurricane got here, I tied my boat down, and it never hit Flamingo, actually. Hurricane Andrew never hit Flamingo, come out by uh, uh, Lostman River and messed up all the banks and messed up all the oyster bars and everything. But so it was on an angle then? Yep. Yep. Because Flamingo is 30 miles due South. northwest. Well, from here. Yeah, yeah. From Miami, I'm thinking. Right. So it had an angle uh, yeah. targeting this yeah, it area. It never hit Flamingo. Interesting. Really. And my houseboat was okay. So I, I mean, I, and I was down there. I was in Key West when that doggone thing came But true. you got hit pretty hard here with Irma. Oh, boy. I got about, oh, I would say three feet. I still have the mark. I had three feet here over the island. If you look around this place, all the screening and everything just blew out. And I had the little building there where I have all my uh, fishing equipment and whatnot and blew all the doors out of that. And across the way, my guest house took all the doors and all the windows out of that. And never went upstairs to mess up my house, but sure messed up all my equipment. I had to rebuild all my machines. I had to take it all apart and all the motors was gone. And, and it was a bad, 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 bad hurricane. You know, you're 85 here soon. Uh, do you leave? I mean, you're pretty risky being on this island and exposed to this kind of water. Uh, do you have fear at all by- Well, by no, because we have- you leave and just come back and pick up the remains? I, you know, the last time when it happened, it took me a year to catch up. It took me a whole year to catch up. I had a lot of tools, I mean a lot of tools. I could have threw it away and buy new ones, but I, I, that was my stuff. So I wanna clean it up. And for a whole year I was cleaning everything, working and cleaning and fixing the house. So if we get another hurricane, I, I have a home in Boca and uh, I just gonna go back and then whatever happens, happens. Come back and clean Whatever it happened, happens, you just come back. And this time, if the house gets blown away, I just gonna order a house. I ain't gonna build a house, I'm gonna order a house and on <laughs> stilts and put it up and, and, but I, no matter what, I'm gonna come back. This is your home. Yep. Um, how did you deal with COVID? I mean, it's, uh, this is- uh, it Didn't bother me none, June you know. 2022. You know, what, what happened in uh, in Everglades uh, City, the mayor, you know, and then a couple of guys worked for him, they applied 
to get for people over 65, get the COVID stuff, and we just went there and didn't even have to get out of the car. They come to our, you know, just jab the needle in and that's it and come back. And then I, you know, I think a month later, the second shot, and then that was it. Oh, that's good. Um, let's talk about, I think your, I mean, your business tool and die. Tell me about what is tool and die? I mean, I'm not really sure. I think it's a- A lot of people don't, don't have a clue what it is. Everything on your car, everything you look around, it's made by dies. You take a piece of flat metal, aluminum, steel, stainless steel, whatever everything, and you form it into whatever, whatever. You make a car hood. I could make a die to make a hood for a car. So a die is almost like a, um, it like a like a almost like a cookie cutter. When you do the dough, you know, and then right. you make round things. So you punch things, punch and things, and bend it, and and very uh, actually to become a good tool and die maker it takes approximately fifteen years, because you really gotta know a lot of stuff. How much the metal stretches, how deep you could draw something is not gonna fall apart. It, it's so much to it, and the, and the sad part, nobody learning it no more because it's too hard. Right. And you just, you know, you just, uh, and, you know, we had to, we used to do a lot of, we used to do a lot of uh, uh, dye work for a lot of people. And uh, we, my last tool maker, you know, left and uh, we don't do it no more. We do it to ourselves, you know, when we have to make a dye, then I go back and, you know, get going on it and make something. Well, let's go back a little bit. Um, a good friend of both of ours, Gordy, Dr. Gordy Hill. Yeah. Um, we got to know each other. We did a couple podcasts with him. And for our viewers out there, he was nominated for a Nobel Prize in Medicine. Mm -hmm. um, but also a, a world-class mind. Yep. I mean, that's obvious being a doctor that's sure nominated it, for a Nobel well, Prize. But, but, his, <laughs> but his fishing mind is incredible too. But this is what he had to say about you. Because I, I went to uh, Dr. Hill. Yeah. And I know that you guys were good friends. And I want to, I want to, uh, I want you to hear so this. We're speaking about Ted Jurassic, one of the greatest men I've ever known, and probably the most intelligent. Here was a guy that never had more than a high school education in a uh, uh, in a foreign country, Hungary, back during the Hungarian Revolution. Never went to college, uh, made uh, his living on his own, and is now worth multi-million dollars, and all of it through his own brain. We'll start from there because that's the kind of guy he is. Wow. Okay. Right? Well, it's humbling. <laughs> Very humbling he said that. That was... I mean, here's one, of, here's one of the greatest minds in the world saying that you're the smartest man he's ever been around. <laughs> when did you first realize you were so smart? When, as a young kid, could you tell that you were had an edge on everybody in Hungary? Well, not really. I, uh, well, I'm thinking back now. Uh, I worked in a bicycle factory. I learned my trade there. And they had a problem with something. Uh, we made bicycles, 15, 20,000 bicycles a day. And I was just watching things, you know, we made everything. Only thing we bought is raw material. This is a giant factory. And I realized when they was making stuff, I was telling the foreman, but I would, you know, let me get back for a minute. In, in Hungary and in Europe, they only go to school, high school and junior school, until you're 14. So this country, they go to school to 18. And after 18, only thing you got in mind is get a car and start chasing girls. You don't gonna think about any kind of, you're gonna learn a trade, you don't gonna think about it, whatever what you're gonna do, or go to college or whatever. Then when you get to 19, 20, then you gotta make a living. See, in Hungary, when you turn 14, then they said, okay, what do you wanna be? Well, I don't know, uh, maybe a carpenter? Well, you could try it. So you have a couple of years to figure out what you wanna be. So when you get to be 18, you could take care of yourself, take care of your uh, family and then it's just a different entirely a different setup and they had very and we and, and then we was going to work six days we only had one day off 
And then when then finally I went to learn a trade, you know, tool and die maker, uh, we as, you know, three days in a shop and three days in school. So we also learn mathematics because you got to know your numbers pretty good, you know, right. when you're a tool maker. And so, so that was that was a, a different different uh, environment what we have here. And we also had my biggest problem when I came here, they don't have no millimeters. They have crazy stuff like inches and and, and <laughs> yards and and still today, still today, crazy stuff like for instance drills. They have drills, fraction drills. Then they have number drills. And they have leather drills. It's crazy. And the millimeters, you have one ten, two tens, three tens, everything, it tens and hundreds, you know, but it's near and there. They still that way, but now with the computers, the computer gonna calculate it, set of inches and millimeters and so forth and so on. So anyhow, I, I could see some stuff when they, especially on shipping, when they was doing this bicycle stuff, you know, so I asked my foreman, I said, uh, why do they, you know, take it from the sand blessing because when you fished, when you did a bicycle frame, you welded it and whatnot, and you had the sand blasted before you, you painted. So they took the uh, bicycle frame, stuck it on big wagons, and took it down the other side of the. F this was a big, giant factory. And I says, why don't they just uh, build the uh, paint department next to the sand blasting so they don't have to move that? I says, Jesus, nobody had the thought of it. So you're but, talking about intelligence that is common sense in that regard. That's it. That's it. And and you got to it's the same thing in sports. You got to born to run fast. You can't learn run fast. Right. I'll tell you that right now, you can't. So you're and saying you were, the, you you were born to think? Yes, I think you so. You can't teach thinking? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you like you were saying earlier, you can teach people to be smart like doctors. Yeah. But that's not in your words, thinking? Yeah, it's no common sense. They they would know what to do, you know that. And I've seen it, you know, not not only doctors. I've seen it with other people, you know. They they so dependent on other stuff, you know. They so dependent on. They want to Google everything. I don't. In a school, they don't even have to learn math no more. They just bring their little calculator. So, and it's to me. Mm -hmm. It, it's not gonna uh, not gonna teach you how to think. And right. sometimes you really gotta think about which has never occurred before. You gotta work it out. Right. Uh, I'm interested with the Hungarian uprising, okay. revolution. If I'm not mistaken, your greatest thinking was possibly during that 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 period of time where you left Hungary. You eventually got to this country and made right. your sex over here. But I cannot imagine what you saw, what you thought, how you tried to figure out, how am I gonna survive outside of my family's home here in Hungary, on my own at 17? Yeah, well. Tell me a little bit about what took place and how you got out. Well, we fought in a revolution, and what happened there, uh, the communist uh, people didn't like the communists, they started doing crazy stuff. So the students themselves risen up. They marched on the thing, holding signs, and then start doing this and start doing that. And then, but these were all the college kids, you know, because they was in college and they learned stuff or how to do things, and they find out communism is just, just not the right thing. It's not gonna work. So then, of course, we went to the, the barracks where the soldiers was, they all went home. The soldiers were nothing to do with it. They don't wanna shoot us. So then they had Russians there, but again, the Russians lived there and then they was friends of everybody, but they don't want to shoot a seat it. So they moved and they bring in a bunch of new Russians, new tanks, uh, this and that, and then they start shooting everybody. We was shooting back, and then of course you can't shoot against tanks. You know you can't. Right. You know. And then what happened uh, after that? You know the revolution. We lost the revolution, and then then the secret police came out of hiding and start picking up people who was in the revolution. And uh, I was, and you were part of one of the right. revolutionists. That's correct. Right. And I, and in fact, I had a uh, and had a rifle. You know, I hid it. You know, I dug a hole in the cellar and hid it there, or all that. Put them in the court and uh, oily court, so it's not go bad. And uh, but then, then two in the morning, somebody knocked on the back door, and my dad answered, and that was my friend's father. He came in a back way. I live on an island in in uh, in Budapest. 
uh, a pretty good size island, you know. And then he says, hey, they just picked up my son and they asked me for your address. And I told him, I don't know. He says, you better go. So I just threw clothes on and wept. Just, he says, I'm leaving. So then I got out of the house. They come to the house. I wasn't there. They searched everything. They didn't see me. So the secret police left. So I made my way to Austria. Was but before you left, I mean, how scared were you knowing that they were looking I for you? I wasn't scared. I didn't, well, I know they were looking for me, but you know, when you're in a revolution, you think different. You, you like, uh, almost like a predator, you know, you almost like, let me go get them sons of a guns and let me do this. You, you think, and it's, you don't think of your own safety. Right. You don't. And I just, just said, hey, I got, I got to go to Austria because, uh, you know, that was friendly to us. I said, I go to Austria and then, so at night, walking. Yeah, how did you get across that barrier? I think that there's a barrier that ha that was all lit with machine gun uh, well, uh, what soldiers. Happened is, and, and there was a no man's zone there? Well, what it is was a no man's zone and they, they uh, uh, tilled it up for a tiller, you know, so they could see footprints where people go on. And they have a couple of towers along the... Uh, border and then uh, they had lights you know going around so you have to watch the light when went over you be hid by the bushes you know and then you could run and we had like five or six guys you know uh, and I was laying there and waiting for the thing and it was mine they had mines here and there and uh, I was watching for a light and I look at the guys I says Sh shoot I says got six or seven guys I says it's like 14 legs I'm going to run by myself because 14 to 1, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, maybe I could make it across so I don't step on a mine. That was my biggest fear, to step on a mine. So one time when a thing come around and these other guys didn't want to go yet, I just jumped up and ran like hell, ran across, you know, in this field. And then uh, I seen a tree and i never forget was an Austrian flag. So that's where I went. Did you feel an unbelievable sense of freedom at that point? <laughs> It was over. Wow. But then again, that was the beginning of a new war, trying to eat and survive and find your well, find your way with no crime, no right? how much you had no money, right? No, my father gave me a watch. That's all I had. A watch and a jacket. How cold were you? <laughs> it's hard, hard to remember. Well, anyhow, so went in a camp. A bunch of Hungarians were in there already, and we was waited there somebody to go another country. And uh, different people come from Italy, France, Canada, Australia. You know, I could have went anywhere, and I was a, a good candidate because I don't had me. I wasn't sick. And I don't have any baggage, babies or whatever. And I had a trade, so I could have went anywhere. So I signed up, uh, gonna go to Australia. And well, the plane is gonna take us, but maybe a month from now or whatever, we was in a camp, refugee camp, and they fed us, we had beds and everything. And gave me a jacket, you know, so because it was cold. And, uh, the people from Australia find some uh, Hungarian speaking person and talk to us and they told us what a good opportunity there. And I says, I, I like that. And then uh, give us a, uh, give us a uh, little booklet about uh, Australia. How big is it? How many people? So forth and so on. And I read there and uh, the man was outnumbering a woman like, uh, oh shoot, probably 30, 35% more men and women. And I don't want to go there. I says, that ain't good because, you know, I had to start a family. That was hard. So I didn't go there. I want to go to U.S. <laughs> and I'm happy I came here. Yeah. When I say you are a man with one of the most amazing human success stories, 
Wow, yeah, wow, that's wow. The, those. The, uh, I mean, that's a real profound statement because we, we all know a lot of people. We read a lot about a lot of people, but you are a living success story. What did Ellis Island mean to you when you when you landed here? Well, Ellis and, Island, Island, I then let it, I mean, when I got off the plane, they they took us uh, Camp Kilman, New Jersey. I never went to Ellis Island. Camp Kilman, New Jersey, was a big refugee camp. That's where I landed and waited for somebody to, I don't have nobody, so waited for somebody to, because you had to sign up to you're going to take care of that person for a year, teach them the American ways, but nobody came. I can't imagine, 17 years old now, you're in a new country, no family, you're alone. So there's got to be, a, I can't even imagine the, the level of hope you must have in your heart. Well, you have to keep going on. You can't screw around, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so. But who was the family that, that took you in? It's a Catholic organization came in and uh, took 10 of us, young boys, anywhere from 18 to 20, 21, and took us to a, a ballroom place, St. Vincent Home. That was a Catholic organization. Took us in where all the uh, uh, orphans live in. We had a lot of uh, Puerto Rican orphans boys. We had some other ones, uh, and they gave us a home, and we're gonna stay there for a year until they teach us English, and then uh, try to find us a job and get going. So I says, okay, I liked it there. But I tell you what, it's hard to think back on these things. And uh, my first thing, I'm afraid to go outside the first day, second day, everything was new, everything was noisy, everything was different. A different language? Oh, yeah, and everything. But I went outside and I seen Coke bottles on the street. And in Hungary, the bottles were very expensive. When you go get uh, ketchup or get vinegar, you had to bring your own bottle. So I said, shit. I looked around, see two, three Coke bottles. I pick it up, took it back into the room and put it under my pillow. I said, God damn, that's pretty, pretty good. And uh, you know, then then I start. You know, uh, they give us jobs to uh, sweep the floor and paint and all that. All this I never forget. The first morning, no, the first lunch. They had nuns, and the nuns was mean. But the kids were rotten. You know, rotten kids. The nuns were mean. They had to be mean to keep, to, keep, to put up with the kids, right? <laughs> I know, I know. And where do you fit in? Well. Not right, not know, mean. No, but I never had peanut butter in my life. I didn't know what it was. So they told us to eat it. There was on white bread, and I bit, and I almost choked from that damn thing. And still today, I hate peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, <laughs> and then, and then uh, you know, but, but I got along with everybody and then helped in the kitchen and helped that. But I, I got to tell you this, though. I didn't tell you when we left on a plane, we went on a plane, went left from uh, Austria on a plane, and a plane coming across, and halfway something happened to the plane, and they told us to, to put our head down and take the pen out of the pocket because the motor quit. It was four motors on a plane. And the two motors on one side quit, and the plane was going sideways. We're going to land it, and we landed. This is hold on good, and blah, blah, blah. And if you land in the water to try to get away. F and I sit there and look and see icebergs and shit. And was uh, Iceland. You know, we, we landed. We crash landed. And blah 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 you know in the snow and it's go bounce up and down on a plane and nothing happened with the plane and then a truck came and they took us into a, a barracks where all the american soldiers was they had a base there and uh 
you know, I says, okay, but was on a truck when they pick us up. You know, I just had a jacket, was freezing to death, how cold it was. Where <laughs> was this plane coming from and where was it going? Was this well, on your- going to the United Trans States. So but it was some, a, this was a big jet that crashed? Yeah, not jet, propeller oh, plane. Propeller. propeller plane. So that was probably getting you to a certain place um, in Iceland for yeah, refueling? right, not refueling, that they, they, they quit. They had to bring another plane to to take us back to right. the United. But you, you know. crash landed there. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God. So, but I never been on a plane, so it, you know, didn't bother me too much. Whatever <laughs> gonna happen, happen. And uh, but the, the, to attach this story is uh, I fished quite a bit in Fort Lauderdale when I finally uh, uh, came down here, Florida, to visit. And I had a good friend in a tackle store. The tackle store was TNR Tackle. And this friend showed me how to snook fish. I didn't know how to snook fish. George Copeland. Not George Copeland. This was, uh, I know George. George Copeland owns the, uh, uh, owns the TNR Tackle. But this guy, Carl Jones, was his name. He's worked there and blah, blah, blah. And we saw on the bridges at, on the uh, commercial boulevard bridge at like 2 in the morning snook fishing. And he says, well, you know, I had broken English. He said, where you come from? That I told him and what happened. He was there stationed and he remembered when a plane came down wow it was amazing you know That's and crazy. he knew about it yeah talk about a small world yeah right? yeah yeah um so you're up in the northeast you yep. you finally get a job and you eventually get down to to florida well um, that, that was a, long, that was a time, long time long time get a job you know i what happened how i got out of the orphanage after two months i got out you know after a month later, they put us, 10 of us, into one room of uh, Hungarian speaking. And I figured it out right away. We ain't going to learn English if we keep speaking in Hungarian. So I told a, a guy who come in once a week, interpret what we want. I said, I want to go with the guys, you know, uh, the big dorm, because they all speak English, because I want to learn. And then at night school we went, and then I myself just went out there, and the guys was like, why do you leave? I said, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And then uh, after about two months, no, about a month, month and a half, I could a little bit understand more because I was forced to understand. Right. And then we, uh, under the Brooklyn Bridge, if I recall, they had a, uh, we had a lot of Spanish kids, Puerto Rican kids. Anyhow, we played soccer. And I know how to play soccer pretty good. So somebody seen me and talked to me about playing soccer, but I, I didn't understand. So I told him someday the guy gonna come who speak, you know, come over. So he was a, a bull of a watch factory, had a soccer team. And they asked me if I would go play for them and then uh, they give me a job. Uh, yeah. So then I went to training, I played with them and everything. And then I still lived in orphanage because I don't have nowhere to live. But now I had some money. Right. You know, they gave me twenty bucks. You know, to uh, game. And uh, we went on to, out to Long Island and we played with a German team, and they had a couple of Hungarians on that. And then we played at night and Jones Beach. You know, play at night a game. And the guy come over. He says, "Listen, why don't you come to play for us?" It was a German team. And then this guy who owned a plastic factory, he sponsored the team, and then they're gonna get you an apartment. So that's how I got out of the orphanage. Wow. And through your professional yeah. soccer skills. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> but then I still wanna work on my trade. You know, I, I, I in, a, in a plastic factory, I was like, a, you know, a, a guy uh, just carrying this here, carrying, they right. don't let me. Was there anything at a young age that you really wanted to learn to build? Was there something out there? I mean, fly reels, you know, that's down the line. You know, we'll talk about Billy Pate and your yeah. relationship, but as a young man, did you ever see anything and think, yeah, I could build that better? Well, no, I I didn't. But the one thing I did see, and I know I I I seen some stuff. What I bought, you know, I bought a toaster. I look at the toaster; it was a piece of crap. You know, I said, "Shit, I would make this different. I wouldn't do this. I would make this a little heavier. I do this." The, still today, it's happening. So every day you see things yes, that you could yes, design better. Yes, yes. What's the biggest thing that you could design better that drives you crazy when you see it every time you see it? Well. I don't know. I, I, uh, 
I got to think about that. I got, well, I'll tell you, uh, I, I don't know how to design that, but these guys who design uh, like uh, a bottom machine, you know, or design, uh, uh, design even a, a GPS or design all these things, they put so many unnecessary things on there, you're never going to use it. But they just put more stuff in it so they could advertise it. Well, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this. And I think it's just made it go from A to B or A to C. And that's it. Leave it simple. But they don't make nothing simple no more. Everything is, to me, it's getting this just way too complicated. Right. Well, well the transformation from the Northeast <laughs> down to Delray, um, when you were up there, you were a professional soccer player. How did you get back into your trade? You were saying that you missed it. Oh, yeah. Well, what happened is, uh, uh, you know, when uh, when uh, went to work for the factory, you know, a plastic factory, and then finally had a place to live, I made some money. Then I looked around for a tool and die shop. And I find a tool and die shop, and I went in there, and I was, you know, I was like 18, 18 and a half, and I could speak a little bit English, but I had a hard time with the measurements because I learned millimeter. Everything was millimeter. Hard time, hard time with the measurements. So I went to a shop, you know, and talked to the guy, you know, they was advertising for tool makers. I says, I know. They didn't believe me, but I told them I could do it. So uh, th then uh, I went to another company and then uh, they hired me and uh, I start working on stuff, and they seen they seen I know what I'm talking, what I could, what I tell them I could do. I did it, and then they, you know, gave me a raise and so forth and so on. And I worked for them about a year, and I figured it out right then and there. To really make a good living, you have to start your own own, own shop. But I had no money, and I was still single. I wasn't married. Still single, but then I could speak English quite a bit better. And then uh, the foreman uh, says, oh, you're doing a good job and everything. So I says, yeah, but you know, I would like to get a raise. So they talked to the foreman and the foreman talked to the owner. The owner says, well, we really can't give him a raise because uh, if you give him a raise, we gotta give everybody a raise in the shop. And I was okay. So then the next day at lunchtime, I went to another shop and I told him, what can I do? I showed him some stuff I did. He says, oh yeah, they give me like 50 cents more in this other place, so I went over there. And I kept working there, and then I kept working there. At, uh, uh, I took everybody's overtime, and I start, you know, saving my money. And then uh, I met my wife, went to a Hungarian dance, I met my wife, because I want to start a family really bad. Why did you want to start a family? Because I was by myself. Right. But you, you wanted know. the family talking about yeah. not only a wife but children too. Yes, 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 yes. Did you? Because you have seven brothers, and you yeah. must have missed your whole family from Hungary well, tremendously. Well, now, now no, 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 no. My my wife had my wife had seven brothers. I have one sister. Oh, uh, okay. You know, and then she had seven brothers, and then uh, she was. Uh, all these brothers hunted and fished all the time, and she thought it's it's you should go fishing. You know, now, and because uh, and then, then, uh, then I had three jobs, and then I asked my uh, father-in-law if I could use his garage if I start a shop, and he says, "Yeah, I, I don't mind." So I went and I bought my first machine. You know, I I bought an old drill press. You know, and then I looked around what dies I got to make dies for somebody. You know, and but I need equipment, but I had no money. And uh, I went to a couple of what I did. <clears throat> I built a lot of uh, uh, storm window and storm doors and uh, doors and uh, and uh, a shower door dies to make that product because I don't have to buy big heavy stuff, you know, because then you need big heavy presses to try right. the dies out. And then slowly I quit my second part time job. And then I start going around at the weekend, you know, people soliciting. And they, they you know, I, I gave them a good price, you know, so they gave me the stuff. And then pretty soon, 
I, I could quit my regular job because I had so much work. You had your own business yeah. at that point. What was more difficult, learning a, a new language or learning the new uh, base of mathematics? Uh, then that was very hard to go from uh, from liters to quarts and 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 uh, miles instead of kilometers and. And especially measurements, you know, special, you know, the small measurements when you got to measure stuff. And the threads, Jesus, they got so many different weird threads in this country. You must think and, Americans are idiots. Well, no, or, no, 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 no. Not no. idiots, but complicated. Why no, make it no, so no, complicated? I, because, no, no. Is there no. a reason for all this? Yes, yes, is a reason because you had people coming here. Right now, we don't have anybody from Europe coming here with skills like we have we have a lot of people coming with skills from south america but they don't have the skills what in europe the swedish has the germans has and so forth and mm -hmm. so on so they come from portugal they come from poland czechoslovakia all that they brought this stuff with them england you know england was one of the biggest uh, uh, country who made a lot of stuff you know they invented a lot of stuff so the english brought some stuff here you know the different threads and the different measurements and all that but now it's kind of easy because a computer does everything you don't have to think right so it was basically a melting pot as far as Ex mathematics that's correct from inter all these international that's people correct. escaping for one reason or another immigrating into this country because i could i can only imagine that and it's true America is uh, the land of the free and home of yep. the brave, and it's a democratic yes. society, yes. and great minds can do whatever yes. they want and and, uh, and and succeed. But till today, I tell you that, till today, I don't care what you want to do, whatever you want to do, still, as long as you, you charge reasonable prices, you show up on time, and don't cheat people, and do a good job, you could you could be a millionaire. But then when you do some crazy stuff, buy, borrowing all kind of money and doing this and making a wrong move and blah, 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 then you're gonna have all kind of trouble. Right. Let's go, um, you know, then at some point you get down um, to Florida, but what is the greatest thing that you've ever invented? Well, I uh, I know that you were involved with the oil industry at at one point. Well, that maybe was maybe still are. Uh, well, that was no, no, no more. That was a funny thing happened when finally uh, they start making pipe, and uh, I supposed to do real well with that, you know. And uh, uh, they had giant giant uh, pulleys that they put this pipe on. They had the ships because they got to lay it, you know. And I'm talking about. 20 feet, 30 feet high spools where they put the pipe on. But anyhow, I'll- You're talking I'll, about laying pipe across the ocean floor for that's oil, correct. transporting that's oil? That's correct. So they finally got a contract from Brazil. The name of the company was Petrobras. And got a, and, and at this pipe was selling, I, I, if I recall, somewhere around $140 a foot or $145 a foot. And they got this giant contract and the company gonna get, you know, really get going and worth a lot of money. The other people who ever made this pipe was uh, in France. And in France, the Coflex company called it, France made the same type of flexible pipe. And the French government underbid us over 50%. In other words, this company in the US was a private company. They're gonna charge $130 a foot. And the French pipe company cost them the same amount to make the pipe and read it, but the government steps in and he says, okay, they're gonna give him 50% subsidize it. Wow. So the company went bankrupt. So <laughs> that's what I know. But you came up with the pipe that they Well, that no, they I didn't. Use, no, I right? didn't. No, I didn't came up with the pipe. I just helped them to get the equipment oh, okay. to make the pipe. Okay. You know? Well, let's get, let's get back to fishing a little bit. Um, yeah. Tell me about your fishing in Hungary, the Danube, okay, big well, catfish, ponds, well, sunfish, carp, carp. sunfish, carp. What happened is during the war, the Americans tried to bomb the bridges all the time, but they missed. They never hit the freaking bridge. They always <laughs> missed. So next to the Danube River had these giant craters. And when we had a lot of rain, these craters filled up full of water. Big craters, you know, 80 feet wide, 30 feet deep and all that. 
in a when a high water, you know, all the fish from the Danube they went into these uh, these fish went into these holes because you know they were safe there and whatever. And when it receded, you know, we had a lot of good carp, you know, especially carp fishing and catfishing and all that in these holes. So we did a lot of that. How would you catch these fish? <coughs> well, what we did, like for a carp, uh, we chummed at night for corn. We, we boiled corn and chummed with it and let it go to the bottom and they come around. They graze like cows, you know, that's how the carp goes. And then, then when we, uh, the favorite, actually the favorite bait was just a hook and a, and a sinker. And then we took bread and we chew the bread in a mouth to make it like pliable and then put a little red pepper in it and make little bowls little and then make it spicy yes <laughs> you just put them in there and we caught the carp was this a a, a means to feed yourself no or this no sport? this is just sport, sport. sport yeah, related yeah okay you talk about food um you know you didn't like peanut butter but i understand there was a red heart can red heart dog food Whoa, or something? Oh boy, that was <laughs> what the hell's was, up with that? Well, that was like you know, couldn't thank speak you, English. Thank you, Dr. Yo, Gordy. Hill. Yes, <laughs> Jesus, that was. Of course, I live with when I when I uh, moved to Lindenhurst to play in this th uh, team, this German team. They had a couple of Hungarian guys, so we lived together in this one house, and we went shopping, and you know, uh, know a little bit, but really didn't know. We just looked at the cans, you know, so picked off the can from the shelf and you know put them in a basket or put them in a cart and then went home and opened it and smelled it and tasted it and it was smell good and tasted good we saved the can or took off the paper and the next time we went in there and bought the thing so we had a guy come and this guy had a sailboat i remember and we helped him mess with the sailboat and uh he spoke a little bit hungarian he came over at night and everything we offered him a sandwich and I just took the can out and put the tank on there. And he says, this is dog food. Says, yeah, this tastes good, <laughs> though. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> and, dog food. Yeah, it tastes, it's, I'm telling you, it tasted OK. Because we ate it. But after that, I said, Jesus, I don't know. You know, you should eat dog food. Are you too <laughs> embarrassed to buy dog food? Would you still <laughs> yeah, buy one if no one's looking? Maybe, you know, if I force to it. Make sure know, no one's I looking. Better eat, I tell you what, I better eat that and peanut butter any day. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Um, the fly reels, what kind of fishing experience did you have here in Florida um, with the, other than the snook with the TNR tackle guys and uh, before you met Billy Pate, because I know Billy really brought you, uh, that oh, was well, the bridge to get that's, the saltwater. To the fly reels, yeah, that's correct. Uh, the beauty, the beauty of living on the beach. Oh yeah, watching people having fun. Oh yeah, that's good. The weather is good. That's, yeah, that's why nice. the weather is good. Well, anyhow, uh, when I was, uh, uh, you know, uh, come, I used to come down. See, I moved to Florida in '79, but before that, I used to come down here for about. You brought my wife and kids. Uh, and they stayed about a month and a half with my, my uh, in-laws. They moved to Florida and they had a home in uh, Fort Lauderdale. So I came down on the weekends for two, three days because I had to go back to work. And then I went to TNR Tackle, you know, buy my stuff. And they, those guys were pretty good. They interacted and whatnot. And then they start crying. Well, they have, you know, problem with them plug reels. You know, they had... Uh, uh, Little plug, le plug, plug reels, you know, the uh, uh, Gar Garcia, I think, made them. And they plastic spool, so when they cast, they cast good, but then if you pack it with the manila, you blow up the spool, you know, right. you, it's no good. So I says, well, shoot, I, I just make some out of aluminum, you know, so we ain't gonna have no problem. I says, next year I come down, I make, you know, bring a half a dozen spools I made. So I took the plastic spools and I busted them up and took out the shaft because, you know, I didn't want a monkey around making a shaft that was stainless steel and so on. And I just shoved it through the spool and I shrink fit it so it's never going to come out. <coughs> and I did that. So they, the guys, you know, they got to know me and this is, you know, well, then they have problem with the bail because the bail wouldn't close down and everything. So, uh, I did a lot of surf casting up north, and we had uh, Mitchell, uh, I believe Mitchell 300 had a big surf reel, had a ball bearing bale on it. So I took the ball bearing off because I can't make a bearing, and uh, I made a little arm which is fits over the side of the spool, and I made quite a few of those. And uh, still today, 
I use them, you know, with no bail, and, and it's a really, uh, uh, see, because if you, we used to use a lot of six pound and four pound test line, and if your roller is done, don't roll, you ain't gonna catch the fish because a right. line go to break. Sure. But this bearing was, so <coughs> I did all that, and and uh, one fellow from uh, Fort Lauderdale, his name is Tony Lay, uh, went to the Keys and worked for Worldwide Sporting. And he Tony said, Lay. Tony he Lay. was the captain. I, he, yeah. I fished against him in one of the tournaments, I remember. Right. Tony, one of the best fishermen I ever seen. One of the very, very good fishermen. So when he was working down there, and, and I called him Tony, you know, blah, blah, blah. He says, yeah, he says, come down, I'll take you to Flamingo. He says, but you gotta bring me one of them reels with the, I says, okay. And uh, so we come back from fishing, went into Worldwide, <coughs> and uh, Billy Pate came in. And uh, Did you know Billy? No, I point? don't know nothing about him. He just came in because he owned Worldwide. Him and George Hummel, George Hummel was a really good guide, and uh, Billy Pate uh, took him in as a partner when he uh, bought Worldwide uh, Sportsman. So Billy came in, and he was like disappointed because he lost a big fish and this and this and that. So of course Tony said, "Well, that'll make you a reel." Complain about the reel. He had a lot of problem with the reel he had. He says, "Well, that'll make you." And it, so Billy Pate come over, and so nice as can be, you know. So I kind of ask him, "Well, what happened?" He says, "Well." This big fish did this, and this big fish did that, and the reel did this, and reel did that. I says, well, let me see. I'd never seen a fly reel before, never, ever. I says, well, let me see. So he showed me the reel, take him up, I took it apart. Do you remember what reel that was? Yeah, it's a finnor. Okay. It's a finnor, not the- Because Seamasters and finnors, I think, were the prominent fly reels. Right, back uh, he no, no, he don't had a Seamaster. Seamaster uh, made very, very nice reel, but the guy was eccentric guy, but yeah. he was a great, great craftsman, you know what he did. But I looked at this reel, I says, yeah, I says, you couldn't slow this fish down, you tightened the drag too tight. I says, because the drag plate was so small, and you didn't take the heat away from the thing, so that's you had all this trouble. It ruined the cork right. and, and, and seized up, possibly? Right. Well, but it got too hot. It got too hot, so too it hot. wouldn't slip. Exactly. Yeah. So I says, he says, you would make a reel? Yeah, I says, I'll make you a reel. I says, what the heck? So I went back all year, it took me next year to come down, so I made one, <laughs> made two actually, anti-reverse. That's what he used, anti-reverse. So I made two anti-reverse reels. I gave him one, I says, I'll keep one. And then uh, he looked at it, da, da, da. he says, well, what do I owe you? I says, you don't owe me nothing. I said, you gotta show me how to cast because I, I didn't know nothing about nothing. He explained to me about the lines, the knots, the hooks. He was a sudden, sudden gentleman, I, the best I ever seen. Quiet, he never ran his mouth, never ran me, 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 you know, none mm -hmm. of that stuff. And he showed me how to cast, and then he took me fishing, and then I caught my first tarp, and you know. What was that like? Uh, well, it was like, I, I, then I could see why the tarpon fishing is so popular, because it's a lot of work, but when it happens, it's spectacular. And then I start watching, you know, some, they had, they had some lousy shows, not so good, but I start more, they had a lot of freshwater guys, you know, and but I figured it out the freshwater guys, you know, they shoot, they don't, they don't need any heavy duty reels. Them, you know, little trout and stuff. They don't pull as hard. So then I start thinking about it, and then I says, well, let me just figure this out. So I asked Billy. He says, well, people want to buy some of these reels. I says, okay. I says, but you know, I don't have the money to make a hundred of them. I can't make only two or three, it, it takes a long time because everything is handmade. He says, I buy a hundred. I says, okay, but I, you know, I don't have the money by material. He says, I just pay half of it and when you finish the other half, bring it down next year. He says, okay, we shake hand. Never, never ever signed anything, you know. Was that the beginning of your company, the big company as, it, as it's been known? No, not really, because I still build dyes. Right. I still build the dyes for a lot of people. You so know, this so is, I did this really is... well. This is, I never made any money on that hundred reels. Never made. I lost money on a so, hundred. So reels. designing fly reels was just a passionate thing on the side that you like to do. Right. I I just, but I could see it's a pretty glamorous fishing, and it's a different people. 
a lot of them not go for a, a for a, a quantity, it go for a quality. I could see that. I mean, a guy's coming in and, uh, but how did you do? Well, I had three shots, you know, and one turn around almost ate the fly. And they kept going because it was a different type of fishing. Sure. And I, I and I fished with people, they had a bad day if they didn't fill up the cooler. Right. They had a bad day. They never even thought about, you know, uh, uh, well, it's more to fishing than just catching. You know, catching. Yeah, filling the cooler up. Was it hard for you to design fly reels? Not really, because it's, uh, it's just, uh, you gotta use what you know about stuff. I know I gotta, in the beginning, I didn't know about weights. Right. So I made it heavy duty because, and also they taught us in school, you know, when I went to the three day schools, when they teach us the, the uh, uh, trade, they say, always make something which is have the least moving parts. Right. You have the least moving parts, then you don't have no problems. Because that also not only reduces the complication of the reel, but it makes it lighter. Yes. What came first, less, the less complicated or less lighter? Less complicated. Less complicated. I just want to do, because if you only have three, four moving parts, mm -hmm. what can go wrong? But right. if you have a bunch of little washers and a bunch of little little springs and a bunch of little stuff, you're going to have all kinds of problems, you know, right. especially salt water. Well, um, it's amazing to see, you know, over the course of time, what these guys did with your wheels. Not only were there, I don't know how many thousands of world records your wheel has, has captured, but the quality of fish that were ca caught with your reel. And I'm just gonna highlight probably the greatest big game fly fisherman of all time, besides Billy Pape, is possibly Tom Evans. Yeah. You take a look at his fish, a 273 pound blue <laughs> marlin on 16 pound test, a 194 pound tarpon on 12 pound test. Yeah. 191 uh, on 16 pound test. I mean, he traveled the world catching the biggest, most voracious fish that swam. What happens to your reel? And he was fishing not with the Pacific, the larger arbor, but the Gulf Stream. Right. Can you imagine that, that Gulf Stream reel catching a 273 pound blue marlin? What went on inside that, the guts of that reel? Well, when you get this reel back, what would you see after he had been at sea for a, a year or so or six months? Did, did you know Billy Pate used to put his reels in a boat in tarpon season? took it out when tarpon season went over. Never greased it, never oiled it, never do absolutely nothing to it. So I learned a lot from him. I, I looked and I did changes which I could tell, you know, what what had need to be done and I'd done it. What were those changes after a season well, of tarpon for, fishing? Okay, well, for instance, you take the handle. You take the knob on the handle. You think about this, when it's hot out there, and you're putting something on, and you're sweating, your hand is sweaty. So you gotta make the knob, it's going to grab easy, your hand not gonna slip off from it, mm -hmm. so you gotta make it out of the type of material which is not too shiny, right. because your hand gonna slip off. And a lot of little things, a lot of, uh, some places, you know, we have some stainless steel, because if you put aluminum there, you're gonna wear it out. Right. People don't even know those parts are in the reel, but you just keep, keep improving. You know who was one of my, later on, one of my best teachers about this stuff was uh, Tom, uh, uh, Dan, Don Green, who uh, owned Sage. Mm -hmm. He was a very smart man. And he kept saying, he says, Ted, you always try to make it better and don't say nothing to anybody, just make it better and better and better. And Sage is one of the best rod companies there. Right, but after a, a, a season of tarpon fishing, when Billy was catching a lot of fish throughout yeah. the course of a year, what kind of wear and tear were you seeing? On a clutch dogs, on a clutch dogs, I could see some wear on a clutch dog, so we, we. I spent some angles on it to beef up the end of the clutch dog so it's none wears out. I could, and then some of the, now uh, all his reels, well majority of the reels was, don't have no ball bearings. They had sleeve bearings in there. And the sleeve bearings, I use oil light. And the oil light is a bearing material. When they make the bearing, a shaft, uh, the bushing, they compress it under tremendous pressure with the powder and oil. So you could take one of those bushings and 
hold the one and then blow on the other one, you see the oil just comes out of the material. So he never had to oil it because he didn't. Right. Now, if you have ball bearing, now some of the Tibor series reels, we have ball bearing, and if you have problem, guys put them in a salt water and they jam up the bearing. You That, no matter what you do, you can't help that. Right. So, so the, you gotta keep, Got to keep upgrading, upgrading, upgrading. And now with the CNC machine, when we could do the same thing, you know, make it really light and whatnot. But now I drop this, my reels. I put the backing on it, put the fly line on it, hold it up in the air and drop it in the bottom of the boat. Drop it on the floor, drop it here. And then if you bend the frame, you can't reel it. So it's very light. It looks good in a box, but if you bang it up, it's not going to crank. <coughs> it's, it's too light. Yeah, it's too light. Um, let's go back um, to maybe some of um, some great storytelling about your relationship with Lefty. Maybe doing some shows with Flip Pallet. I remember yeah. Walker's K was just the yeah. best. I remember, um, I think you were guiding Flip, and he hooks his big old tarpon along a mangrove sh shoreline. Yeah, yeah. And you were going, Flip, Flip, it's a big, big, big tarpon, big, big tarpon, Flip, Flip, it's this big tarpon. And yeah. Flip goes, Ted, you got a big tarpon on? <laughs> oh, it's so big. I mean, you were so great. Uh, well, I had uh, fun As a guest doing on it. these shows, I mean, tell me about your friendship with uh, Lefty and Flip. And how well, much they met to not only well, you as a friend, but to the well, company. I'll tell you some story about Lefty. I I, uh, I admired him a lot. Uh, he was working for uh, working for 3M, you know, with the, uh, with the fly lines and whatnot. Then he uh, uh, worked by Sage, you know, and uh, and my booth was right next to it, <clears throat> and. Uh, a guy comes up and he was some kind of big executive guy with a beer case for the app, you know, briefcase for the Apple people and all that and talked to Lefty, blah, all kind of, you know, stuff. And he was very well mannered, very well looked like a big time executive. And a little kid comes by the boot and he's just standing there and it's just, so Lefty says to the guy, says, hold on, hold on. So, yes, son, what do you, well, and, and he rather talked to that kid and this, head guy, whoever he was, I don't know who he was and everything. And that's meant a lot. If you watch, you know, if you watch these kind of things. Right. And that-, that He was a heartfelt what, guy. Yeah, he was. I mean, my God. And he was organized. I went to his house, you know, a couple of times. When I had my surgery in John Hopkins, they took out my prostate. I had prostate cancer. And then went by his house. I stayed there a couple of days until I recover and whatnot. And he was so organized because he had so many calls. My God, I never seen. And he answered every letter, every call, every everything. And and uh, you know, it's a, well, you talk about your life. You know, you want to yeah. be left alone. You don't want to be famous. That's you want to enjoy. That's correct. The fruits of your labor. Um, I admire people who want to share and give that to that level, but I don't understand what they have left for themselves, you know? And, um, you know, Flip too, he's a superstar. Uh, but I understand Flip and I know him, he would rather be in the woods somewhere than trying to, you know, oh, yeah. well, talk about the love, but that's, that's okay. Well, you know, everybody has their own. Uh, as long as you're happy, you sleep well, and uh, you took care of your family, very important, you know, took care of your family. And uh, I mean, it's, it's uh, for instance, you know, uh, uh, you can't tell your wife not to do a, a, a new kitchen because you're buying a new skiff. It's not fair. <laughs> and I understand that. But it is fair. <laughs> You know, but they do it. You know, they right. do it. Well, whatever. But if you take care, of you you gotta be you gotta be like happy with yourself. Well, I did everything. You know what what I need to be done, and I take care of him, and then send them through college. I had a very good friend of mine, very good friend of mine, and actually we broke up a friendship because I sent my kids, you know, to college. And his kid wanted to go, but uh, his dad didn't want to pay. He says, well, I, I didn't get paid, da, da, da. I had to go on my own, let him. Da, da. He could afford to send them. He should have sent them, you know, and I, I, I didn't like that. Is, 
you know, we're talking about to thyself be true, as Lefty was, as Flip was, as you are. When you look back, I can't imagine anything that you did you would have done differently than how and what you did. You know, I mean, you survived. You survived what was taking place in Hungary. You got to the states. You figured it out. You got your business. Uh, you have a great family. You, now you have your little paradise here in Everglades City. I can't imagine. I mean, you've lived. You connected the dots perfectly. Is there any dot that you wish you would have done a little bit differently? No. Well. The one thing, it's, it's pretty selfish, but I'll tell you. I went to Louisiana with John and them, you know. and John Donnell. John Donnell and Mike Ehlers and all them guys. And I was there a couple of, we went two, three times and everything. And if I would have known how was the fishing in Louisiana, I should have settled there. <laughs> And it's still I, great, right? I, I'll tell you what, I never seen a place, never seen a place. And I went to New Zealand, I went to Caicos, I went everywhere, never seen a place. And still today it's like that. Every bayou you went, the shrimp was jumping. Now I watch some of these shows on television, which is say Louisiana law, and they say backwoods law, they say Texas law. But I wa and they show the law, uh, the people, you know, the fish cops going on boats and check people's licenses and whatnot. In Louisiana, when they go to these boats, every boat, shoreline, they go to these guys sitting in there with a bucket. Everything is full of fish all the time. It's amazing. The boats are full of fish. The guys on the shoreline full of fish. The guys going down, a, stop him on the road. The coolers are full of shrimp. I never seen a place like that. And, I and was the just, size of redfish are just yeah, enormous. Yeah, my goodness. Uh, but, but then we went shopping over there, the Piggly Wiggly, and these guys come in here, black guys and all kind of guys, nicest people ever. You know, it was like a, a real uh, a real relief, you know, to see that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I, I wish I would, because <laughs> I would have known, you know, I would, we went by a, we went by a, a, a industrial complex and what stopped me, I told John, stop, stop. They had a sign out there. They said, the sign says, we bend pipes up to three feet diameter. Think about that for a second. Three feet diameter pipe. What do they push through those pipes? Oil. What yeah, else? yeah, for sure. And then I says to John, I says, I, I bet you I could work that machine and all that, you know. <laughs> and I said that if I would have went there, I don't know if I would have been, you know, lucky enough like I hear. But then my biggest uh, luck, what I had doing all this my life, I never got sick. Because once you get sick, you can't help that. Right. And it's a so no matter how hard you want to work, and then you get sick, you can't, and that's a that's a big setback. So right. I was very fortunate I didn't, you know. Well, as we go through life, um, you get to certain stages. I'm at a new stage. You're at a new stage, um, and you kind of wonder what do you want to hang on to? What's the most important thing you want to hang on to and still have access to? For me, I don't care about skiing anymore. I did that forever. Yeah, I'd go up and slide around a little bit one day, fine. But I don't have that great desire to still do that at a great level. And I do have that for for hunting big elk with bow and arrows. I do have that for chasing big tarpon. And I can do that with my body starting to, you know, starting to go away, if you yeah. will. Yeah. Do you have any fears about your future at eighty five? None at all. No, 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 not at all. Um, but I tell you what, uh, and, and you probably do have to do this. The most valuable things me and you have is time. See, when I learned my trade, that was the most important things in manufacturing is time. Time is money. And we are running out of time. You're never going to get back this hour you spent here. Right. So you get really have to have your time. That's why I don't want to be on a phone with people, talk about this, talk about that. Time, time is the one, I can't replace this time. It's the most invaluable most thing Most valuable thing I got is time. I was talking to your good friend Steve Huff last night about that. 
Yeah. I just called him up at 6.30, talked to Patty. Where's, where's Steve? He was still on the water. Yeah. He gets back. I speak to him uh, the last, late last night. I said, yeah, have him yeah. call me when he gets in. He calls me at like 9.30, 10. Yeah. I said, you just get home? You know, but he said, you know, as we get closer to the end, we appreciate more today than what we've ever had um, because there's, we're running out. Um, and with that being said, um, I asked him, I made, I gave you the quote of Gordy Hill, what yeah. Gordy said about Jesus. you. Here's, I said, Steve, what, tell me a few words about your great friend, Ted Jurassic. And Huff, Steve Huff says, Ted is the most real human being. Huh. What comes out of his mouth is real. It's honest. He's opinionated, but justified. He's worked hard his whole life. He's the most patriotic American I know. He carries the torch of the hardworking people who gave everything they've got. Well, to me, it's, it's clear. I mean, you got to work hard. The harder you work, the luckier you get. And I know that for a fact. And you can't, you know, you, you just... Let me, ask, let me ask you this, Ted. Yeah. There's one thing about working hard, but there's another thing about working hard chasing your dreams. Well, I... Did you work hard chasing your dreams? Initially, maybe you were working hard to, to, make, to feed your family. This, not but the, what about the, your dreams? Did you have yeah. these dreams that you attained? Well, actually, you, you believe it or not. When I was a kid and grown up and, you know, and then, uh, you know, I would get to be 12 and 14 and you dream about stuff. And I always said I, I would be made a real good lighthouse keeper because it's in a brutal place, the big old lighthouse, wind blowing, snow coming, this and that, and ain't no people around and I'm working on the lights, you know, keep the lights burning and everything. I would be perfectly okay with that. That's what you do right here. <laughs> that you are the keeper. You are the keeper, Ted. Yeah. What do you think your parents would say to you if they saw your success today? Well, my mom, you know, my mom was, was, uh, was an incredible uh, person. And my dad, you know, very hard working guy, very hard working guy and taught me one thing, which he said, uh, I translate this to you. He says, when you have money, what you, what you wanna go do with it, or borrow money, whatever it is, he says, you, st you stretch in a bed when you have your uh, cover on, but don't stretch from under the cover out because your feet gonna get cold. I translate with, this. With, when, uh, live within yourself, that's within correct. your means. That's correct. And that's, I never did that. Did you know still today, you know, all the equipment, I have the factory, I paid for cash for everything. Mm -hmm. Because I saved up my money to, to, you know, and that's, you learn it. But this country built on credit, and I understand all that, and, and, and you know, I understand, but I don't have to follow it. Yeah, well. You're a wonderful lighthouse gatekeeper, <laughs> and, I, and you've been a great friend to many of us. And I just want to thank you, Ted, for being a friend and giving me all the reels that I won all my tournaments with. Yep, yep. Well, you were you're, you've always been so generous and kind, and I just want to say thank you on behalf of Nikki and I to have you come and sit with us. Uh, I know your privacy is very important, but you extended your morning to do this, well, and I really appreciate my, that. My pleasure, my pleasure, Andy. Thanks for coming by. Thank you, buddy. Okay. All right. Okay. When I saw it's West Side Story, when I saw it's just a road.